2024 marks the 150th anniversary of the Sagrenti War. What exactly was this war? And were there any benefits from it? Should we even bother to remember this date? With me is historian Yao Anochi Frimpong for answers to those questions. You're welcome. Thank you very much, my brother Kafui. Before we even get into the business of the war and what exactly does Sagranti come from? What kind of word is that? Sagranti mm -hmm. uh, is the name, in fact, a corrupted form of the name Sir Garnet Worsley. You know, our people substantially were illiterate. And to be able to mention or call the full name of the man who led the British army against the Ashantis in 1874 would be a mouthful. Mm -hmm. So the corrupted version, Sagrenti, Sagrenti, something like Sir Garnet, Sir Garnet. Mm -hmm. And we are told that at the time, he was about the finest British soldier. There was a rebellion in India, and this man had been sent there to quell it. And he did it so expertly well that when the British Parliament felt it had to reduce, not just reduce, to completely annihilate Ashanti and bring it under its domain, it was the name Colonel Sir Garnet Worsley that came up. At that time, in the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, what was the state of affairs in the Gold Coast? It was like this. You see, we had the Danes on the Gold Coast, we had the Dutch, and we had the English. In fact, the Portuguese had been driven away by the Dutch and all their put, uh, possessions taken over by them. And then the Danes had sold their possessions, including the famous Christianburg Castle, to the English. And then the Germans had also left the Gold Coast, having sold their possessions to the Dutch. So the major powers here then were the Dutch and the English. Then in the 1860s, there was a change of possessions between the Dutch and the English. And this would seriously affect the fortunes of Ashanti. You would recall that far back, about 250 years earlier, the Ashantis under Osei Tutu had defeated Denchra and uh, Intimid Jakari. And it was the Denchras who held the notes of the Elmina Castle. And so every year they had to pay heavy amount as, uh, to the landlords, mm -hmm. to the Denchra people. And so when Ashanti defeated Denchra, all these years they were taking lots of money from the Dutch. For that reason, the Ashanti and the Dutch had become very good friends. In fact, the English would not supply arms to the Ashantis because of the interest of the Fantis. Because of the interest of the Fantis, mm -hmm. you know. So the only place where the English, the Ashanti would get arms and all the uh, resources mm -hmm. they needed from Europe would be from the Dutch mm -hmm. people. So they had become friends. The Dutch would always arm them to be stronger and stronger in order to get more slaves for them mm. to be shipped away. So this was the state of affairs until the change came. So and when this, they I, I can just um, assume that this was at the height of the slave trade. At the height of the slave trade. Mm -hmm. So when the change came about, the British or maybe the English had acquired the Elmina Castle. So once they had acquired the Elmina Castle, it means that there will be no money to be paid to Ashanti. Okay. Second, it meant that they would, not, uh, <clears throat> they would not easily sell goods to the Ashantis. And here I need to explain. The Ashantis avoided 
buying goods from the English at Cape Coast for two main reasons. The first one was that the Fantis, who neither imported goods from Europe nor captured slaves for sale or did anything at all, profited heavily from the British Ashanti trade. Why? The Ashantis would bring their gold, slaves, and cows, and other uh, resources from the interior and the north to Cape Coast. Now, the Fantis would not allow them to see the English, let alone trade with them. Just as the English, uh, the Fantis would also obtain goods from the English and would sell to the Ashantis for big profit. So the Fantis were like intermediaries or agents? Always the middlemen middle. and made a lot of money. Okay. And what pained them most was that the English would always remove customs duty from nations they, cl they classified allies or civilized. And Ashanti was not in their list of civilized nations. So Ashanti would have to pay heavy duty on the goods sold at Cape Coast. And then also, the prices would go up because unlike the Dutch, the English felt that they were responsible for the administration of the areas immediately within the confines of the forts and castles they controlled, more or less like a colonial mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. So the course of administration was put on the goods sold. So it means Ashanti going to buy goods in Cape Coast would be about three times or more higher than the prices of goods at Elmina. So they wanted to eliminate the Fanti connection? They always wanted, that was okay. why constantly there, was, there were wars between the two. Mm -hmm. So this was what happened there. Mm -hmm. And to make things worse, the Ashantis would wake up from their sleep one day only to hear that uh, Elmina had changed hands. Now it is the English people controlling Elmina. So it means that the same cutthroat prices suffering at uh, Cape Coast would be meted out to them here. Thank you for setting the stage and giving us this background. So now, what occasioned the Sagrenti War? Was it uh, uh, initiated by the British or was it uh, an attack by the Ashanti? I would say both. Both because... I've already laid the foundation about the uh, exchange of the force and castles. And the Ashantis seriously protested. They protested that they did not want to see the English people at Elmina. And they were right to a very high extent because Elmina was part of Ashanti territory. Elmina was part of Ashanti territory. Also. Because after the defeat of the Dangerous when they defeated the dangerous people in Team Jacker and started obtaining the notes and started trading with them, they made sure they had to protect the interests of Elmina at all times as a way of protecting the Ashanti traders mm, okay. along the coast and as a way of always securing arms and ammunition from Europe because anytime they lost that. They had to go down to Asini, to the Nzema area, which was a very long journey for them. Mm -hmm. So they made sure they had a nest Elmina. And the Dutch also respected that as a way of bringing peace between themselves and the Ashantis. And the people of Elmina were also competing with the Cape Coasters because you see that apart from the Far East Castle at Christianburg, Osu, the only two castles we had in Ghana, you know, the castles are the major forms of the fort, were the Elmina and the Cape, Cape Coast, Coast Castle. So the trade concentrated in these three mm. areas, two southwest and one southeast. So it was very lucrative for uh, the Dutch to respect Ashantis as trading partners and also to acknowledge Ashanti as owners of Elmina. So for you to trade Elmina, exchange it between the two of you without reference to reference to the Asantehine was a big sacrilege. It's like selling my property without my consent. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So Elmina was 
Ashanti. Mm -hmm. So more or less, as you rightly said, without the consent of Ashanti, how do you go and trade in Elmina? So was there communication between the Ashanti of that time and the British authorities over this, the, after this trade occurred? There was, the war? There, there was communication. Mm -hmm. In fact, the British governor then, uh, uh, Halley, the Ashanti, Ashanti Hini protested to him and he was ready to accept and understand the Ashanti position. And what he did was that he would continue to pay for the notes to the Ashanti Hini in order to ensure there would be peace. But before he realized, the Fante people at Cape Coast had taken over the notes. You know, the notes transferred from the Dutch to the English. For whatever reason, it fell into the hands of the Fantes. And the actual, you know, whenever you are trading with somebody or you lease your property to someone, you know, every year the value would Go appreciate. Okay. And so the cost of it would also be adjusted. So these notes basically were testament to some kind of uh, commercial agreement which required that some amount of money was paid. Had to be paid to, to the yeah. Ashantis, okay. like an indenture. All right. And every year or every period, they reviewed it. Mm. You know, so original copies were in the hands of the Ashantis. Yes. But the review had fallen into the hands of the Fantis for no apparent reason. And they declined or refused to make the Ashanti Hini know the actual fee that was supposed to be paid to them. And later on, when they learned that the Fund, the money they refused, uh, received was not what they were supposed to obtain. They felt that the English and the Fantes had come together to deceive them. Mm. So Ashanti started sending soldiers down the coast, you know, to fight them. Do we know what the numbers were in terms of like strength of their armies? In fact, the Ashanti army initially sent was twenty thousand, then under. A four. Then later on, they had to send more. So it became 40,000. That's a lot of people. It was a lot of people. And <laughs> we are told that crossing the river Pra alone at Asen, Asen Pra, so it took five days. Wow. Yes, because 40, people. Yeah, the boats were small. Yes, indeed. And the Ashantis were not used to water, mm -hmm. you know. So they had to, I mean, when I say what I mean, rivers. Mm -hmm. rivers so yeah. they had to take their time mm -hmm. to be ferried. And that alone took five days. And the moment they got there, they started uh, rampaging and burning down Asen villages. What kind of arms did the Ashantis have at that time? The usual arms mm -hmm. that... Guns? The guns, the okay. usual mm -hmm. guns mm -hmm. that, uh, like what our people will call Tia mm -hmm. You know, you shoot and you have to... Uh, break it yeah. into two and reload. reload. Yeah, it's yeah. not like the modern ones we have today. So in those days, your numerical strength mm -hmm. would determine whether you win a war mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. So they had state-of-the-art art weapons, mm -hmm. but you cannot say uh, compare it to what we have today. Indeed, of course. But yes. this is a long time ago, yeah. 150 years ago. So the Ashantis went there with a view to protecting their interests. So they burned the cities, the t towns in towns Asin? Towns in the Asin areas. Heading towards Elmina. And towards Elmina mm -hmm. and Cape Coast, mm -hmm. in fact, because you cannot succeed in Elmina alone Without and Without Cape Coast, yeah. Yeah, and then the governor was informed about, about the impending Ashanti invasion. And the governor would not listen because according to the notes we have, records we have, Every now and then, the Fantes would report to the English government at Cape Coast that the Ashantis are coming. And then his investigations would prove that it was just wolf. Why, why wolf. were they doing that? Because they were always scared of the Ashantis. <laughs> and also the Ashanti traders would tell them that Ube, mm. once we get to Kumasi, the Ashanti you know, will come in. You see. You know, and they felt that it was something that would actually happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, so always they would go and make that report until that day, I mean, that period when indeed the Ashantis were seriously coming and then the British people had not fully prepared for them. When did contact between the British and the Ashantis happen? Where? In this particular war? Oh, always it was uh, at the Asin area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Asin Yankumase mm -hmm. or Fante Yankumase. Mm -hmm. That was where they would meet and do their 
palavas. Mm -hmm. And even when the Santegini was made satisfied that they would pay them all the money they needed and they would allow them to trade at Elmina. The Asantehini wanted to recall the army to Kumasi. And then the Ashanti chief said no. They would not return until they had had the walls of the Cape Coast castle in their hands, you know, as war trophy. But so, wasn't that uh, disregarding the orders of their king? No, it was like telling the king that don't worry. We will win. Uh, we'll win. Mm -hmm. And then you will control the whole of this area again. And mind you, if Ashanti is able to defeat uh, the British in Cape Coast, they will control the trade less the Fanta middlemanship okay. agency. So you make the goods, uh, cost of goods cheaper and they can make more profits because there will be no middlemen. Yes. Okay. And then slavery too will continue. Will continue. Okay. So they enjoyed it. I mean, Santa Hine mm -hmm. just succumbed to mm -hmm. his people. So, so he appointed uh, Amankwetia mm -hmm. to lead them. Okay. And then the Amankwetia man too was somebody that the Ashanti, I mean, the problems they will have later was the fact that they found him as a drunkard, as a very lazy person, womanizing. And uh, even the letters the governor wrote to be sent to the Asante Hine to recall his truce so that they would, the two would sit down and, talk. and make peace. Amankwetia mm -hmm. uh, sees the letters. He wanted to fight. He wanted to fight. Was he like a, 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 a commander? He was the, in fact, the commander, the, the general commander, command, uh, command, the general officer mm -hmm. commanding the Ashanti army, mm -hmm. more or less the commander-in-chief mm -hmm. of the Ashanti army. Because the Ashantis, you know, Banta Mahine is always the commander-in-chief of the Ashanti mm -hmm. army. It used to be Asafo. But because the Asafo Hino could not protect Obri Yabua, mm -hmm. and the Doma people killed him. When Okonfo Anoche landed on Ashanti soil, he demoted him and made him second to Bantama. So every Bantama Hine will be called the Kronti Hine, and then Asafo Hine will be the Akwemu Hine, second in command. Mm -hmm. So Amankwetia will be made the king, but uh, will be made the commander. But the soldiers themselves wanted the Mamponhini to have led them because Mampon traditionally is also second to Kumasi. Mm. I mean, less war to a second to Kumasi. They didn't like Amankwetia, but because of the uh, existing war formation, Amankwetia had it and he became the head. And then the British, too, on the spur of the moment, had to take a decision as to how to contain Ashanti because. The governor didn't know that his letters were not getting to mm. the Asante Hine. So he fell on the British Parliament for advice. And then what did he advise? The advice was the bringing down of their final soldier at the time, Colonel Sir Garnet Worsley. Mm -hmm. And before he also came in, he gave his terms to the British government. You know, around that time, uh, West Africa was called the white man's grave because they died in their thousands yes. along the mm -hmm. coast of West Africa. They did not know. Because of malaria and other diseases. Yeah, and they didn't know it was the mosquito killing them. Mm -hmm. They thought that it was bad breath coming from rotting trees mm -hmm. along the coast. They also drank from our waters freely. They didn't know that that was also causing them diarrhea and dysentery. So these two factors would always kill them. As a result, the British were never prepared to pump in many soldiers. Mm -hmm. They rather love to bring in commanders here. And then they would train local people okay. in order to fight. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, Sir Garnet wasly asked for the finest of the soldiers, numbering 2,000. British soldiers. British soldiers, white soldiers. Mm -hmm. British soldiers. And then uh, in, on the Gold Coast, they had 600 trained soldiers. So he had 2,600. Did he have any reinforcements from the Fantis? The Fantis refused to join them. Mm -hmm. And their reason was that the Ashantis had already landed on their land. Mm -hmm. You know, they had already arrived fighting them at Anomabo, Mankesim, Elmina. And the protection was only at Cape Coast. 
you know, almost all the fancy towns that Ashanti had, they demolished their houses. And even in Cape Coast, we are told that uh, because of the heavy rains that year, many buildings had fallen and uh, refugees from Asen and other fancy areas were sleeping in the streets. Mm. So the Ashanti, uh, sorry, the Fantis wanted the war to end as early as possible so that the Fantis would leave their land. For that reason... So the Ashantis they would leave their land? Would leave their land. Mm. For that reason, they refused to contribute soldiers. Okay. But they, they had one, uh, Captain Glover, who was sent to the eastern side of the country and brought in troops from Accra and then uh, Aquapim and Achim, okay. you know, to be of help to them. And then they also brought in troops from the West Indies. Mm. And then they, yes, and then they brought in troops from the Hausa and Northern Nigeria. And then Lagos, they brought in troops from Gambia and Sierra Leone. This was a coalition. A huge one. <laughs> against Ashanti. Against Ashanti, a very huge one mm. to ensure that the number would even double that of the Ashanti yeah. army. Okay. And then also, Whilst the troops had uh, arrived, they also made sure, that was towards the end of 1873, they made sure that more soldiers would arrive to surprise Ashanti. At that time, Ashanti had had a serious problem because led by the Ewes, you know, the Ewes most of the time had been the map readers of the Ashanti people. Anytime they wanted to make incursions to the east, at, uh, under uh, Dubofo. Mm -hmm. And it is said that they had lost over 20,000 soldiers in the east because they wanted to invade the Oyo Empire with the Ewe people in Nigeria. Yeah. In Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And Asantehine had to call uh, Dubofo immediately to the coast when they learned that Seganet Wesley was arriving. And they also learned that one from their own entourage they had sent to Britain, you know, they wanted the British to understand them because as part of the 1831 treaty they signed with the British, the Ashantis were to give up all the tree speaking tribes they were holding on to. Uh, the Wasa, uh, Achim, uh, Chifo, and then Asen, Denchira, and Elmina. And then the Ashantis felt, no, this was purely an African affair. So when we make a treaty with you, you do not say that we should give up on this state because before, long before we came in, these people, we had conquered them under Osei Tutu and they were serving us. So how do you think that you could thinkably receive them because they said they want to serve you? How do you say you have received them so I should give up on them? And then second, you said that we should stop human sacrifice. The Ashantis wanted Queen Victoria herself to understand Ashanti tradition and for that matter the African form of religion that whenever a great king died for us it was just a transition to the other world and you needed slaves and servants to accompany you to go and serve you and so it was not a matter of the Santehine always getting up to kill people but that when an Asantehine or a famous chief died here, somebody had to be made to accompany mm -hmm. the king. And for them, they didn't see it as murder. Mm -hmm. They found it as part of their rituals, which they felt Queen Victoria should be made to know. And then again, the people being killed were those who were already their war captives. Mm -hmm. So whether we kill them to accompany the king or not, being war captives, prisoners, I mean, we could dispose of them in Anyhow, any manner at all. How did Asante justify the slave trade? So that was the way in which they, ju they justified the slave trade to the effect that when you have captives in war, you destroy them. And when you destroy them for no profit, it is better to sell, sell them. Mm. The, the first advantage is that you make money. The second advantage is that it may be that you may not have a good place to keep them. And then they are going to starve. So you are saving their, their lives. lives. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't want to save their lives and you don't want to keep them because of the high cost of it, you have to kill them. Mm -hmm. So they believe that slavery was a very good way of making profit and also saving 
human lives and then helping the buyers to make use of them wherever they wanted and to. And of course, there were, there were Europeans who would buy the human beings anyway. When there is no ready market, mm -hmm. how can there be mm -hmm. market? Yeah. So always it was buy and it's sell. Demand uh, and supply. Demand and supply. So if there is a ready demand mm -hmm. and then the supply will come through wars, then I will fight and then get more people supply, make money. And then the state becomes pro pro prosperous, and then the trade also booms. So Ashanti had 40,000 troops on one side, and then the British coalition with people from various ethnic groups from abroad, um, Caribbean, Gambia, wherever, on this side. What were their numbers? The history tell us how many numbers they had in the end. They had about 40,000, mm -hmm. about the same number. Okay. Okay, but the Ashanti advantage over them was the fact that Ashanti knew the terrain more than all these people they had brought in. Two, the Ashantis, two, really knew war. You know, apart from the well-trained British officers, you will not be able to compare anybody they had brought mm -hmm. with the Ashanti. So that's a slight advantage Ashanti had over them. But the British advantage Ashanti also had, sorry, they had over Ashanti was the fact that this was the first time the British decided to destroy Ashanti power once and for all in order to bring coast, uh, sorry, peace to the coast as a way of governing the entire country. So they wanted to eliminate or just completely cost, subdue Ashanti, Ashanti power. And all their allies mm. at all costs. Mm. So this was the first time they thought about this. So it was not a war that would end mm -hmm. until the British had won. And this was something the Ashanti never knew because at all times when the Ashantis fought, whether the British or any of the coastal people, even the chief speaking people, they ended the war when they had succeeded mm -hmm. and then plundered the villages and would carry the booty to Kumasi. Women, goods, things like that. Yeah, jubilantly. Mm -hmm. Gold, whatever they would find, mm -hmm. carry them to Kumasi and sell off the slaves. This was the first time the British taught themselves that Ashanti should not carry anything to Kumasi. Second, we are going to pursue the Ashantis into their own country. And then third, defeat them there the first time. And he had some lessons to learn from what we just discussed, the Nsamanko War, 1824, the Battle of Nsamanko. Mm -hmm. You see, Sir Charles McCarthy had had the same plan, except that he made a mistake of going to the bush to meet the Ashanti army face to face. That was mm -hmm. the first mistake. The second mistake was the fact that he felt Ashanti was just a savage, backward tribe that did not know the art of warfare. So with just a handful of people, you could just uh, baffle them and then destroy them, which was a mistake. So uh, Sir Garnet Worsley decided first and foremost to do what Captain Sir, George, Sir Charles McCarthy had done by carrying the war to Ashanti, but not to fight them midway as McCarthy did, rather to fight them on Ashanti soil. And being the first time that Ashanti was fighting on his own soil, Sir Garnet Worsley felt that psychologically, you know, Ashanti would be defeated, seeing their own villages mm -hmm. bent down the first time. So in this war, there was no fighting in the, in the, in, in the central region area? The, the, this the, particular... the fight was what the Ashantis themselves had brought mm -hmm. when they were coming so When they were coming, down. burning through Asin and all yes. those towns. And when the, Fante, the, the British saw it, immediately they brought in a heavy load of troops, as I said. Yes, indeed. And then fought the Ashantis and repelled them. Okay, so pushed them back. Pushed them back. And Kumasi. pushing them back towards Kumasi, mm -hmm. the main British army quickly took the main uh, Cape Coast Kumasi road. Mm -hmm. That was the main road. Mm -hmm. And technically, his reason for doing that was that the main Ashanti army, mm -hmm. which was almost uh, 40, about 40,000, 40, would have to cut new roads, mm -hmm. and that would weaken them yeah, and then them delay them. Exactly. So with that, they were able to get to 
Ashanti first. Oh, the British, yeah. got to, uh, British Ashanti, troops got to Ashanti first. Ashanti first. first. Okay. And then Ashanti also realizing what could happen to them. You know, they were also warriors and they knew the art of war. So Amankwetia advised uh, one chief, the Anantahini, mm -hmm. called, uh, I've forgotten the, Asamwa Nkwanta. Mm -hmm. Very good. His name was Asamwa Nkwanta to try and fight the British people, not directly attacking the main army face to face, but in a form of a guerrilla mm -hmm. style. Okay. So as also to delay them on the way. To get to Kumasi. For them to, to enable the Ashanti to okay. get to Kumasi okay. and also regroup properly. All right. And he did it with an expert efficiency. So hit and run. Yeah, he did it tactics. so well that yeah. he was given a, a title, mm -hmm. Okra Srafwa. What does that mean? Like the one who could uplift the soul mm. of the Ashanti. You know, Christ's soul. Yeah, in yeah. fact, he did so well mm -hmm. that uh, at Fosu, you know, and won a battle against the British mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. But Sir Garnet Worsley made sure the main army would not waste time mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. So he kept on advancing moving, towards Kumasi. advancing towards Ashanti. What were the, 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 the levels of the casualties like in this, this war as they were trying to push towards Kumasi? A lot of people died? It's a good question. Because when Ashanti arrived in Kumasi, the main Ashanti, metropolitan Ashanti, mm -hmm. their army had reduced to 20,000. And wow. 168 chiefs had died. You know, the chiefs were always like the junior commanders. Yes. Uh -huh. So it means they had lost 168 commanders and 20,000 of their soldiers Half of had their died. fighting strength had gone. Yes, had gone. So that should wow. tell you that I mean, it was not an easy thing okay. at all. Did the British suffer culture? They also too? suffered, if not more. Mm. But their advantage was that whilst Ashanti did not have replacement, because as we began by saying, they had lost heavily in the Volta region mm -hmm. when they were invading mm -hmm. Oyo. Mm -hmm. and, and, side, yes, side, yeah. and between 1867 and 1874 was not long enough to have more men to grow up and then train them to come and fight. It was not easy for Ashanti at all. But in the case of the British, they kept on bringing in troops okay. from Hausa land, mm -hmm. from Lagos, okay. from Sierra Leone, Gambia, and the Caribbean. So always replenishing what was lost. Yes, and that was why the army became bigger and bigger. What happened when the British got to Kumasi? When they, they did not immediately get to Kumasi, mm -hmm. the, Ashant the Ashantis were able to hold them at Adanse because uh, the Ashantis sent in a German mediator called Kune. So you will see that he will come from the Volta mm -hmm, mm -hmm, side, mm -hmm, called Kune, to go and plead with the uh, Sir Garnet Worsley to return home, you know, and that he will respect the terms of the 1831 treaty. And we know the major terms of the 1831 mm -hmm. treaty. He also assured him that he will make sure the trade routes would be open. Well, well just back it up a bit. What, what were the terms of the 1831 treaty? First and foremost, human sacrifice will have to stop. Second, all the three speaking mm -hmm. tribes serving okay. Ashanti, mm -hmm. no more to serve mm -hmm. Ashanti. Mm -hmm. And then three, to give up on Elmina mm -hmm. and then uh, open the trade route so that all of us that would trade. make use of it and then stay peacefully. Okay. And Ashanti had said no to everything. So this time they had said they would respect everything. Then the British leader, Sir Garnet Worsley, informed the Ashantis that they had arrested some Fante Asen uh, soldiers, thousands of them. They should quickly release them. And then some missionaries, Presbyterian missionaries. You see, anytime Ashantis found white people on their land, they suspected they were spies. Mm. So they had arrested and they didn't understand their mission, mm -hmm. that they were just godly mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Ashanti Hini decided not to release them. Against the advice of the Queen Mother, the Ashanti Queen Mother said, please, let's release these people and make sure that these uh, white people would not set foot on our land. The Ashanti Hini said no. And the reason why he said no was not to disrespect the Queen Mother. But he said, at the time when I called them, 
They told me they would not come mm -hmm. until they had had the walls of the Cape Coast Castle in their hands. So if they are coming without the walls of the Cape Coast Castle, then I will also not receive them. Exactly. Until he heard that his people were dying in their numbers. Mm -hmm. And then the, I was making a case that the Ashanti themselves has sent a delegation to Queen Victoria. They stayed there for six months and they would not receive Queen Victoria because she sent a message to them that her representative on the Gold Coast was the governor. So she herself would respect the governor if she would bypass him mm -hmm. and then deal with them. So they should go back and deal with the governor. So why did they stay there for six months? They, they stayed thinking that eventually the queen <laughs> would change her mind. So when they arrived on the coast, they were the first to know that the British were preparing to attack Ashanti. Mm. So immediately they changed their... <clears throat> well, I wouldn't say they changed their course, but I would say belatedly they took the advice of both the governor and the queen to go and negotiate with the governor mm. here mm. that they should quickly recall uh, Sir Garnet Worsley. He accepted it on condition that they would immediately pay for all the uh, expenses that had been incurred as a result of the war, and also release every troops. So was Kumasi occupied? Kumasi would be occupied later, mm -hmm. because the Asantehini would not accept that. You know, would not accept. Uh, and then the Asantehini would also send two of his sons, mm -hmm. his own children, to the British, you know, as like protege, to be kept, a form of panyarit in those days, to be kept by the British as proof that the Ashantis would respect their terms and organize money and then pay whatever they were supposed to pay. And then Saganot Wesley responded to them that if you had been able to send a delegation of six men to the UK, what shows that you can't pay this money? Mm -hmm. And the British also had learned that in order to send the delegation to the UK, every Ashanti man was taxed to pay 10 shillings. So if you, have, you know how to raise organize, funds, raise like funds <laughs> what sure you cannot pay this? <clears throat> and then sending your two sons to us. Later, the Fantis explained to the, Ashan, uh, the British. British that where you have come among us, the Akans, we are matrilinear. You understand? We are matrilinear. So when the Santehini sends you his own children, he's losing nothing. And then we are also, um, uh, like, we could marry so many mm -hmm. women. You understand? Yes. So it could be that this... Uh, Children, children are even coming from some woman that he doesn't even really like, <laughs> he doesn't so like he's so got no love for them. No, so <laughs> just ignore them, yeah. and the British took that mm. advice mm. and then uh, ignored the whatever the Santehini was doing. And so they will get to uh, before you enter Ashanti proper, you know, the presence Adanse. Mm -hmm. So they cross the pra and enter the San Adanse. Then the Adanse, you know, Kwajo Obey was a very powerful man. He encouraged, when all the Ashanti chiefs were scared, he encouraged them to rise up and fight in defense of their land. And he told them that he had a bountiful supply of arms and ammunition, which he would supply to them so that he would fight the British. Did they listen to him? They listened to him. So they fought? They fought. And immediately the Ashanti he told them that, told him that they would do everything to make these 20,000 soldiers face head on with the British at a location which was ideal for the Ashantis near Bekwai called Amwafu. So he should be able to hold them immediately or at uh, Dompase mm -hmm. and Formina. Mm -hmm. And he brought in Asamuan Kwanta, the one I have already mentioned, to assist. They did their best, except that the British troops were just pouring in day in and day out. So they pushed the Ashantis to Amwafo. And indeed, a serious battle was fought over there. Ashanti was defeated. And the British moved on. To Kumasi. To Kumasi. What happened there? They reached Kumasi at a, in the evening, 5 p.m. of 4th February, 1874. 1874. They got to Kumasi. And the, uh, the, the, uh, the general, Sir Garnet Worsley, Worsley sent a message to the Asantehini that he needed to meet him 
to make a treaty with him. <clears throat> Surely, Dasante Hino would not go. I mean, he feared that they would capture him mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. ridicule him or something like that. So Dasante Hine never went. He stayed for two days. Dasante never came. Then the British also realized that for as long as you are in the heart of the enemy territory, you could be surprised. <laughs> that was not a safe thing mm -hmm. to do. So what he did was to set fire to the city of Kumase mm. and to burn down the palace. Wow. And we learned that they took a lot of gold. Gold that Shantis they didn't need because the Shantis then had so much gold which they had hidden. So the little, even the little they found over there for the British writers was something that surprised them. They took everything. Well, there was away. more. There was well, more. The Shantis felt it was <laughs> nothing. So in, in the haste, mm -hmm. they left all this there. They burnt down the palace. That was the first palace built for them by the famous King John Kwani of Nzimaland mm. at Pampaso. So the pal present palace at Menshia mm -hmm. would be a latter okay. one. Huh? So they burnt it down. So the site at Pampaso, does it still exist? Today? That's where they still have two houses. In fact, mm. that's where the golden story. Oh, okay. They have their two houses. Mm. There, but that's originally was, Pampaso. You see that it's on a hill, it's on a hill. overlooking the rest of Kumasi. And Menshia was only a flat land where the townspeople, when they beat Gong Gong, people will go and meet and mm. listen to their oh, chiefs. Or, uh, your mind Shia. Shia. Uh -huh. Where the town meets. Would meet. Shia means to meet. Very good. Oman town. Uh -huh. So okay. eventually that was where they built the, mm. uh, the modern palace. palace. So they burned down this old palace, mm -hmm. which was built in the form of a fort. Because the man who they built it for them, uh, John Kony of Zimmerland, he knew the technology from mm -hmm. the Germans. Mm -hmm. so this cast, uh, fort palace was bent down and then they met the uh, representatives of the Asantehine at Formina where the Asantes now acknowledge not just to respect the terms of the 1831 mm -hmm. treaty but this time to serve the British. So they actually signed this treaty with Queen Victoria? Queen Victoria to serve the Represented British. by Sir Garnet? Wesley, yes, ground. on the ground okay. to serve the British. Mm -hmm. Never to fight again, I mean, all the other terms included, and also to pay for the cost of the war. I understand which was, the indemnity was 50,000 50, ounces, ounces of gold. Of gold. Wow. Yeah, which was a lot of money. Then to, in today's so money, it will be a lot. Basically taking money from Ashanti to pay for the cost of this war that was persecuted. Because they felt that the war was precipitated mm -hmm. by the Ashanti mm -hmm. people. And you know, in every war, uh, the terms will become the victor's terms. Exactly. Yeah, so... Or everything was imposed on Ashanti. What was the, 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 the state of affairs as far as human sacrifice was concerned? Was it part of the, tre the treaty as well? Number one. Okay. So Ashanti was made to stop and they agreed mm -hmm. never to return to that again. How about trade with the British? Was it now free trade? Now there will be free trade mm -hmm. with the British, mm -hmm. which eventually would also benefit Ashanti. Because as soon as Ashanti was defeated, mm -hmm. the British now extended the Sekendi Takwade Takwa railway line to Kumase. So now Ashantis also began to be sophisticated. And then the missionaries were allowed to do their work, set up churches and schools. So Ashanti started having education. Mm -hmm. And then because of the free trade and then the introduction of the cocoa economy, now Ashantis would also learn uh, cocoa farming. And so it became useful for them. But there were other uh, after effects of the war. Mm -hmm. So this Sagranti war, which took place 150 <coughs> years ago, why is it significant to us in the 21st century? Extremely significant. I, 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 it's a very lovely question you are asking for our people to know. Extremely significant. The first significance of this is... You know, somebody who had entrusted some care, some faith in you. Now, you meet another person in England and decide to do something behind him. And I mean the betrayal of Ashanti by the Dutch. You see, <clears throat> Elmina was Ashanti territory. Now, the treaty to exchange the force took place in England including Elmina, in disregard of Ashanti interest. 
So the first thing for us as Africans and black people to learn is that no matter the differences existing between white people, Europeans, they were more interested in their interests yeah, more than interest. their positions. Common interests mm. more than their positions. At mm. any time, they were ready to sacrifice their positions and then t stick to interests that will be of a higher benefit to mm. them. Mm -hmm. So that was the first one. The second one was that, as we began by saying, the British themselves had decided to take the whole of the Gold Coast. And if you take the whole of the Gold Coast, the southern tribes were of no consequence for them. Always it was Ashanti. So they had already planned at the Westminster to come and destroy Ashanti. So it's of significance to us that at all times, these people are thinking not once, twice, and three times about us, how to plunder us, and then take whatever we have, irrespective of whatever friendship they have with us. Another significance of the war was that <clears throat> In 1874, because it was their agenda to take over the whole country, by defeating Ashanti, immediately they extended it to the north because the Ashanti allies, the Dagombes, and also their vassal states, you know, the British took over all of them. Now turn to the east. The same Captain Glover, who had organized Aquapim Ga and Akim troops for sake, uh, Sir Garnet Worsley was sent to help the Aquapim and the Kroba people against the Ewes. Mm -hmm. And the Ewes also sent emissaries to Ashanti. Because they were allies. They were war allies mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And I believe you are learning mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. between Ashanti and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Ewes. You know, they had always been war mm -hmm. allies. You know. So they sent emissaries to Ashanti to bring in more soldiers to help them. And Asante Hine sent three men to inform them the defeat, about the defeat that had occurred to he himself. <laughs> me and myself, the, me myself, I'm suffering. Yes. How can I send you men? men. And then the <laughs> treaty he had signed. So with that, the Ewe people quickly surrendered. And the famous Jalukope Treaty was signed between the British and the Angola people. And it means that they came under the British. So Ashanti came under the British in February, and then the Ewes came under the British in June. And then in September, having succeeded to take over the whole country, the British now passed an act in their parliament separating the protectorate of the Gold Coast from Lagos and Sierra Leone and giving it a full colonial status. There will be ripples everywhere. Mm -hmm. The war reverberated everywhere. What was it? Initially, the Fanti people and the Gans, who had always been helping the British, had been treated as allies of the British. The moment Ashanti was defeated, they were no longer treated as allies, but as colonial people. So initially, when the British would plead with you for soldiers to help us fight Ashanti, this time there was conscription, forced taking of soldiers, and then they would also levy taxes on them in order to run the whole country. So, so their friendship were, was a strategic one. They used these people to further their big aims. Okay, so after they conquered Ashanti, then they finally showed their true colors. The true colors. So it was after 1874 mm -hmm. that the Fantis also told the British that, no, we don't need you. We want you to go home. Too late. Yes. And then the British told them that, yes, it's too late. <laughs> and mind you, we have already angered and wounded the Ashantis. So when we leave, Ashanti will overrun all of you. So the British and the Ashantis will have to sit down again. Mm -hmm. Thinking over it, they felt that the British were a necessary evil, master, evil in fact, a necessary evil to stay because making them go away, the whole country will come back into the hands of the Ashanti people. And we will end by, we cannot end unless we talk about the scramble for Africa. Around that time, because of the Sagrenti War, many of the Akan states, hitherto seven Ashanti, had their freedom like German, Bontuku, 
and then the entire Bono people, and then the Enzimers at Basam, Asini, then up the Jula people, and then midway, the Bawule and the Enyin people, who were all Ashantis, and in fact, part of the Ashanti kingdom, yeah. they seceded from it. And the French immediately took advantage of that. And that's Ivory Coast. Th that's Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. That was why we all say that before 1874, Ashanti controlled an area almost three times the size of present-day Ghana because Togo, Benin automatically was part of it and they were even going to take uh, the entire Oyo, Oyo where they mm -hmm. are, uh, were allies. Mm -hmm. Then up was, because of the Mosi people who are the natural brothers of the Dagomba and the Mamprusi, mm -hmm. you no, know, Ashanti had influence mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. And then the western side, as I said, the Bono people there. So to this day, the capital of Bono is left in Africa. Bono Manso is in <laughs> Africa, and so many Akan states being there. That's the capital why, of Bono is in Africa. In Africa. <laughs> That's why when we are playing football, football with them, you hear them having many Akan names. Exactly. Even their first president, yes. Hofua Buanyi, mm -hmm. it is Ofe Buanyi. Mm -hmm. Ofe Buanyi. Mm -hmm. And then Laurent Poku. Mm -hmm. Laura, La La Lawrence Poku. Poku. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that was it. And that was how uh, the, the, the effect of the war. In fact, if the Ashanti had not been defeated by the British, the size of present-day Ghana mm -hmm. would have been almost three times this one. And then if Ashanti too had not been defeated, the other side of the coin is that nobody could predict what would have happened to the southern states without English protection. That one nobody could tell. And so now you know the significance of the Sagrenti War, which took place 150 years ago in 1874, and the ripples that reverberated not only throughout the Gold Coast and present-day Ghana, but all around the world. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Anoshi Frimpong, as always, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for this deep dive into history. There's a lot more that we can learn from uh, the history of Ghana and the Santi people. And uh, in the next video, you'll get to know a little bit more. What has fascinated you most about this particular uh, telling of history concerning the Sagrenti War. Put your comments down uh, below and let's have a conversation. But for now, hope you've enjoyed, hope you've learned a lot. I will see you in the next video. God bless.